Welcome to Faith and Politics, a show dedicated to discussing issues surrounding the intersection of church, state, and politics, and the examination of whether you're allowing your faith to shape your politics, or are your politics starting to shape your faith? In other words, what do you do when God and government come face to face? I'm your host, Orlin Johnson. Let me introduce you to our panelists for today. First, we have Mr. Rashern Baker, who's the president and CEO of Baker Strategy Group and the University of Maryland professor of public policies. We also have with us Mr. Alan Reinick, who's the executive director and general counsel of the Church State Council. We have also with us Mr. Tim Schultz, who's the president of the First Amendment Partnership, an organization dedicated to protecting religious freedom for Americans of all faiths. We also have with us Mr. Lawrence Brown, who's the senior pastor of the Queensboro Seventh-day Adventist Church in New York City. Gentlemen, great having you here with us today and looking forward to our conversation. You know, beginning with this particular item, I find it kind of interesting. Um, earlier this year, Governor Kay Ivey, she issued an executive order to promote and protect religious liberty in Alabama. When you think about that, you have to wonder why on earth does a governor have to do that? She put out an order that specifically stated promoting and defending religious liberty through the implementation of the Alabama Religious Freedom Amendment. She wanted to make sure and to further strengthen this piece of legislation that looked to already be in place, but also wanted to make sure that this should be something that what she called the cornerstone of the American way of life and her personal beliefs as a governor. She wanted to make sure that protection was in place, that people would have an opportunity to serve their God the way they see fit. And she said, as I have promised under my watch, our state government will always reflect the values of our people. You know, Tim Schultz, when I look at this type of situation, on one hand, I'm completely comfortable with the idea that you've got this RIFRA law that's in place. On the other hand, I've got to call into question that if you have a governor who's saying, well, this is also part of my personal beliefs as to why I'm putting this executive order out there, have I gone a little bit too far or does it matter what her personal beliefs are as long as she's promoting those rules and regulations that the state has already signed off on? Well, I think it's very common for politicians to cite their personal beliefs as part of their decision-making process, and I think that's totally proper. Let the voters decide whether that's proper or not. I think in this case, it's very common for governors and other executive officials to issue executive orders that are sort of their thumbprint on what an existing law means. Obviously, those are still subject to judicial review, but they're they're sort of binding the executive branch of government and saying, hey, we have a statute, here's what I think the statute means. And then it's also important to know that this didn't happen in a vacuum. This happened because of a very bad decision by the Alabama High School Athletic Association that more or less forced Oakwood uh, Academy, which is a, an Adventist school down there, to have to forfeit a playoff game because they wouldn't play on the Sabbath. And there was an easy accommodation available. The Athletic Association, like lots of big, dumb bureaucracies do, uh, did not allow for an accommodation. And I think that the governor was so incensed by that whole episode that this executive order arose in that context. But Alan, let me ask you about that whole idea and the muscle of an executive order. What exactly does it really mean? Well, in this case, it's simply reminding everyone of the existence of a very important statute. And I think that the context of, of why we even have this Alabama uh, religious freedom statute is very, very important, because in 1990, the Supreme Court basically trashed the, the free exercise or protection for free exercise of religion under the First Amendment. And many states stepped into the breach and said, no, we believe we need to protect religious freedom under our own state constitution, our own state laws. And so you have these laws like Alabama's that uh, unfortunately, government agencies need to be reminded that they have to respect the religious diversity and, and, and the faith and practices of the people. So that's what this whole context is about. You know, that's a great point that you're raising there. And we've talked about that in other instances, Alan. And Lawrence, let me ask you, that reminder from a governor 
to let people know that this is the law of the land from a religious standpoint, it almost seems like that might be the first thing we always have to do every time a new governor comes in, make sure that they are willing to actually put a statement out there to quote unquote, remind employers and remind others. And then in this particular instance, she wanted to remind state employees what their roles were and what it should be. Maybe this is one of those things we think about, but this is a way that maybe you can start to put it up at the beginning or at the top of the food chain for people. Well, it's certainly something that bears consideration because if you've spent any length of time around this type of advocacy, you very quickly realize that the more things change, the more they remain the same. And I applaud, quite frankly, the governor's willingness to remind her constituents uh, just what kind of party this is and how we want to operate. When I say party, I don't mean political party. I mean, you know, party party. Uh, but but suffice it to say that um, the more we do to remind people of how we ought to be at least aspiring to operate, the more we do ourselves a favor. And um, again, this is a situation where the governor demonstrated and gave leadership to the fact that what we are not reminded of, we will forget. And, and that's why the fourth commandment starts out, remember, you know, some things we just can't afford to forget. And, um, you know, I applaud her for, for her willingness to, um, to remind us. You know, Rasharan, one of the interesting things about that whole matter, and I had a chance to travel with the team now there, there was some real concern that this was a statement that was being made in the midst of a political race that it looked like it may have been a little bit tight for Governor Ivey. And there was a lot of people saying, well, maybe she's just trying to do this because there may be one segment of the community, she may get a bump in from one percentage point that may make the difference between being elected governor and not being elected governor. When you see those type of things coming into play, should we ever want to ask ourselves the question, is this something that's being used for political purposes or do we not even worry about that and say, let's just make sure the right thing is being done and not being concerned as to how you may be quote unquote involved in the political process? Let me see, a, a politician doing something that could help them win re-election or win an election. That's a shocker. <laughs> no, shocking. I, I, shocking. very, very shocking. Uh, I've never done that myself. So. <laughs> Um, but I do want to go back to, I think, you know, Tim hit it right on on the head. You know, as an executive, I put out many executive orders to reinforce my administration's belief about a particular issue. Um, so seeing this happen, I think most people looked at it as not overly political, but reminding people of what the administration, in this case, Governor Ivey, um, belief is in government. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, is one of the powers you have as an executive that you use to the fullest effect. It only lasts throughout your administration. Uh, it is not indicative of the next administration, but it does remind people, and especially your staff. You have to remember, uh, governments are big. Uh, in, in my case, in Prince George's County, we had 6,000 employees um, and 16,000 school employees. And so occasionally you want to remind them of what your beliefs are and how open your government is and what you believe in. And so in this case, it was the right thing. I find myself, you know, surprisingly agreeing with Governor Ivey on an issue, but in this case, she was absolutely correct. And I think she used the tool of her office in a correct manner, and that is to remind the public, but more importantly, to remind those who work for the public uh, that this is their belief. You know, Alan, out there on the West Coast, you have a governor who probably puts a, quite a few executive orders in place on a regular basis. When you think about the power of being in charge as being the chief executive of a state and the willingness to use some of what I would call your credibility to put on a line for an issue, what does that say about that individual from your perspective? Well, I think it's an important part of leadership. Uh, you know, we're facing some religious liberty challenges here in California from state agencies. And I only wish the governor would be willing to, you know, put his foot down and, uh, uh, you know, direct his own agencies to respect religious freedom. Uh, in, in this case, the Department of Corrections. But that's a story for another day. Well, when you think about this, Lawrence, I got to ask you. 
The governor then decided that she wanted to invite the students to come down and visit with her and, and take pictures with her. And you know, and, and there was a lot of consternation whether or not that may be a bridge too far. From my perspective, the idea of when the chief executive would like to come and talk about something positive going on. And the one thing that I heard on that moment that she was with them is that she said, listen, the only reason I need you here is so the world will understand that your faith is more important than anything. And these young men end up forfeiting their opportunity to play for the state championship. The idea that they're willing to go and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody who may be from potentially a, a different uh, party or different persuasion, I mean, it seems to me that that is the appropriate thing to do. And under these circumstances, it seemed like that was probably the best thing that could have taken place. You see, this is why it's such a beautiful moment, because when you understand how fairness works and how certain principles make a difference in people's lives, no matter what's, what part of the spectrum you're coming from, then that says to me, you get it. There are things that personally I, I don't support, but I will always support people being treated the right way. You may think differently from me, feel differently from me, but it is important that we send out the message that some things just transcend uh, varying uh, points of opinion and ideas about how things go. So far from just being a photo op, far from just being a talking point where she can score uh, points with different parts of the demographic, it's a moment where she sends the clear signal Sometimes it can't be about are we on the same page or not? You think this, I think that. Sometimes it has to be about this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to be on record having done the right thing. Tim Schultz, you've probably been in environments where you have probably hoped that maybe there would have been a governor somewhere that would put an executive order out. How do you go about the process of, of trying to potentially even make something like that happen? Here it was a particular case, then the governor jumped in based on her own personal point of view. When you're in this, this particular arena trying to make those things happen, what is the process that usually takes place to get there? Yeah, usually what happens is religious groups get together and they go to the governor and ask her or him to do it. That's what usually happens. Um, and, you know, part of the rationale for executive orders is it's sometimes the second best option because usually you would hope that the legislature would pass the law that the governor would sign. That would make it permanent. Um, you know, when executive orders are issued a, lot, uh, are issued, a lot of times they're undone by future administrations. Probably not in Alabama. It's a Republican state. You know, no future Republican governor is going to come in and overturn this uh, executive order, but certainly we've seen that a lot at the federal level. So usually it's a result of lobbying, and usually executive orders are sort of fine, but they're always kind of your second choice because you'd rather have legislation that's permanent or as permanent as it can get. Well, when I look at a situation like this, you know, where you actually had a RIFRA law that was in place, that maybe some of the local groups were not really utilizing it to the, uh, to the maximum ability, it's almost like the executive order becomes the belts and suspenders on an issue. That's right. And I well, think also, that's the point. You, go ahead, Tim. You prefer not to have to go to court, right? You prefer to have agencies be put on notice so they do the right thing without having to be sued under the statute. And I think that'll be the last word on this because that's the point. How do we get this done without necessarily having to fight about it in court? Because we all know once you get into the courtroom, it's a complete roll of the dice as to what's gonna go on, regardless of sometimes where the law may be. You know, keeping with the state of Alabama and talking about, you know, this executive order that the governor had to put out, it really kind of connected with the case that was called the Oakwood Adventist Academy versus the Alabama High School Athletic Association. This was actually a situation where Oakwood Adventist Academy, which believes that they should be celebrating their Sabbath from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, had an opportunity to make it to the playoffs for the very first time. The problem was is that when the semifinals games was announced and the schedule came out, it turned out it was going to be right in the midst of their Sabbath. Uh, they decided that what they were going to do is to reach out to other schools and other institutions, see if they could make some accommodations and move some things around. And it turns out all the schools were willing to do so. 
However, the athletic association comes back in and says, unfortunately, we're not gonna let that happen because our rule is we want to ensure that things keep moving forward exactly how we want. And this isn't personal against you. It doesn't matter what religious group you were, we would have told you the exact same thing. And so what ended up happening is a lawsuit had to be filed against the association. Um, the young men ended up missing the playoffs. They had to forfeit. This was not something that got done before that. So you had these individuals that had their one chance, their first chance, and completely lost that opportunity. However, what we see at the end of this is the court case now found out that they'd had to be settled because they came to the conclusion that this was something that, in my opinion, they did not want to keep talking about in public. That they decided there was an easy accommodation to take place. And this is a type of thing that you would think is just the right thing to do. But it seems as though if you don't sometimes bring people into the court systems, you don't end up getting hopefully the result that you're looking for. You know, Lawrence, when you hear this particular case, you know, what was the first thing that kind of hit you when you thought about the idea of religious organization are involved in sports, told that there can be no accommodation, and you lose out on basically, for some of these young men, the chance of a lifetime? Well, uh, it, it was a particular interest to me because I, I graduated from Oakwood, not the academy, but the college, now university, that that's connected with it. And I've been doing this work long enough to know that you can always accommodate, but you can always try. And here they didn't even try because, as Tim pointed out earlier, had they tried, had they been more amenable to taking a look, to try to figure it out, they would have discovered that there's precedent for making the kind of accommodation that was being asked for. And what makes this especially so egregious is the fact that there were others willing to work with them in making this happen. And so my indictment against the system today is that you just have too many people that won't even try. In fact, many of the uh, cases that we win here in New York turn on the fact that the employer didn't even try, had things they could have done and just chose not to do it. So the young man took a stand and made an even bigger statement than they would have made had they won the whole thing. And it's, it's beautiful to see that today you still have principled people who would rather take a stand for what they believe is right, even if it's going to cost them something very precious. And at the end of the day, those are the types of people that we want to see going on, uh, being in leadership, because principles matter, having a backbone and a willingness to take a stand, those things matter. And we're better off when we know we have people like that who are part of the fabric of what we're trying to do. When we look at the dynamics of what took place here, you have a government bureaucracy, essentially, which is the uh, uh you know, the sports uh, authority, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but their attitude is we make the rules, we make the schedule and don't bother us with, you know, having to make any adjustments. We're the ones who have the power. And there's another dynamic here, which is, you know, we're not going to make any exceptions for anybody. You know, it's kind of equality over inclusiveness. So people who have needs, whether it's disability or religion, and, and they need some special consideration, some accommodation, they get excluded. And the powers that be are perfectly content to just do what they do, keep on doing it without any consideration for the people they're actually serving. Uh, and, and that's why we have laws to specifically protect things like religious freedom or disabilities. Well, Tim Schultz, how do we push back against those arguments for those organizations that say, you know, if we start pulling out a day for everyone that has, quote unquote, a religious accommodation, we'll find ourselves maybe only being able to play on Mondays and Tuesdays. And based on <laughs> what we're looking at, that's something that, you know, is, is unworkable. I mean, how do we handle those type of conversations? Yeah, that's a hypothetical objection, though, because it's there's lots of people who could make the accommodation request now. They really don't. There are a very small uh, number of religious groups in the country that practice Sabbath in the way that the Seventh-day Adventist Church does, for example. 
And I think that it's just, it's an objection that that hasn't proved to be real in the real world. And I think that we ought to err on the side of accommodation. Accommodation isn't an absolute principle, by the way, right? There may be some times when accommodation is impossible, but it's the sort of presumption of accommodation that the Athletic Association in Alabama absolutely failed in this case. And as I said earlier, big bureaucracies lots of times are stupid. And a lot of times taking them getting beaten in court or upbraided by their governor to get their act together. And I'm glad that they did so. I wish it would have been earlier in this case. You know, Sharon, I got to ask you when we talk about government and, and big government and bureaucracy, that even when a government sometimes knows what the right thing is to do, because it's so bureaucratic, it turns in a slow way. I mean, I look at this particular case, the case ends up getting settled. Um, they end up getting a right answer, but there are some young men who just missed out. But is that sometimes just part of the process that when you got something so large and it turns like a battleship instead of a speedboat, that people are gonna end up losing out and that's just kind of part of the process. Uh, am I missing something there or is that a reality of life? No, it is a reality. It's, a, it's the most frustrating part about being, especially an executive in a government, whether you're a mayor, whether you're a governor, uh, whether you're a county executive, that's the frustrating part because the bureaucracy outlives the political entity. And so in this case in Alabama, there was an accommodation that could have been made, but because the bureaucracy chose the wrong path, you know, you had to go to court and the governor had to issue an executive order just to once again speak to the government to do these things. Um, unfortunately, you're absolutely right. This happens a lot. Uh, we've seen it in cases where the young lady, I think it was Ohio, who had a, a job, uh, had, had uh, religious care and was banned from running because she she had that. Um, so there are accommodations we could make. And a part of government, and I used to say this to, to my government all the time, is we want to get to a yes. We want to help and make sure we foster more people participating in our democracy and not less. And that includes their religious freedom and includes their participation. And so, um, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us and the work that everyone is doing on this panel to continue this fight. Because if not, somebody in a room somewhere is going to check a box and say, are you eligible to play on this day? If not, then you forfeit. Not looking at reason or anything else. Um, so it's incumbent upon those who are in elective office, office and those who advocate to make sure we're pushing um, to make sure everyone is accommodated if they can be. So Alan, why is it so important in particular with something like sports that there be an accommodation? If you're a religious organization, someone would say, well, maybe you should be in an association of religious organizations. Why should we quote unquote have to rearrange things when you quote unquote are part of a private organization and we are a public organization and therefore it seems like we're having to bend over backwards for you. And you know, and, and some people say, but this is just sports. This isn't the difference between quote unquote living and dying. I mean, how, how do you handle those kind of arguments? Because I know you've seen this before, Alan, in other parts of the country. So sports takes on an enormous role in our society. And it's a place where we expect our young people to learn very important values. And you know, if, if this team had simply gone their way without challenging it, what would the lesson have been for the kids? That because of our faith, um, we're second class citizens, that we don't count, that we're going to miss out on opportunities throughout our life. And so the, you know, the public entity is going to communicate that if you really want to be part of American life, you have to compromise on your faith. That's the message we want to send to these young people. I don't think so. Sports is all about inclusion and giving people a chance. Uh, and, and I think this is a very important place where we need to communicate our values and say, yes, everyone can play and, and prosper, as it were, based on your own performance, your own ability. We give everybody, you know, we, an opportunity. And, and that's what America is about. That's the whole concept of, of equal opportunity. We don't exclude people because of their skin color or because of their faith. Tim Schultz, it sounds like that's the real point here. It should be equal opportunity for all. 
and you should not have to quote unquote potentially be the best of something in the world and don't get a chance to demonstrate that or exhibit it simply because there are some conflicts as a result with your faith from a scheduling perspective. It, it almost feels like it is un-American. A- am I missing something here? No, I think you're right. And I just hope that this whole episode is made into a movie someday. I think it's a <laughs> classic example, a little bit like the famous case of the conscientious objector, uh, Desmond Doss, uh, of Adventists leading the way on religious freedom. And even though I am not an Adventist, I am so grateful for the way that Adventists have taken stands over the years uh, that in ways that have not only protected Adventists, but lots of other people, too. Well, you know, when I think about this case, Rashern, it reminds me of one thing, that it's so important to put the right people in elective office. Because if you end up putting the wrong people in, you really find yourself fighting these fights more often. And, uh, you know, I, am I missing something with that? Or, or what are your thoughts from that perspective? And you're, you're absolutely correct. And the, and the right people in office, in this case, take Alabama, where there's a governor who I probably wouldn't agree with on anything. In this case, she was the right person because she understood um, not only the power of her office and symbolism, having those children come down to the governor's uh, office and meet with them to show the rest of the state, and more importantly, as as has been stated here, uh, the rest of the government, that we should find ways to accommodate. Um, And um, I think it's important when we're electing people to office that we get people who are willing to do the right thing. And that's really what. Uh, this case was about in the governor's perspective of doing the right thing. And so uh, we want to do that. I'm going to have to let that be the last word, but I think that's pretty much buttons it up with the idea. When you fail to put the right people in office, you open yourself up for these type of activities that may not work in your way, especially when it has to do with common sense. Rashern, tell me something I don't know. Well, I'm, you know, we call Springfield, Massachusetts home. And did you know that John Brown actually met Frederick Douglass before the Harper's raid in Springfield, Massachusetts? Did not know that. Alan Reinick, tell me something I don't know. Well, I was going to go a different direction, but after I heard that, I have to tell you that, uh, you know, uh, the Bronx, New York was named after a Dutch family by the name of Bronx. Didn't know that either. Lawrence, we're coming to New York. Lawrence, tell me something I don't know. As I indicated earlier, I'm a graduate of Oakwood, well, now University of Oakwood College, with with a visit to one of the Supreme Court justices. I learned that uh, my school, which also has a strong basketball program, was on at least one occasion responsible for breaking his bracket. Wow. <laughs> Good information. Tim Schultz, tell me something I don't know. Tim Keller, the New York pastor, has passed away at the age of 72. He's really a legend. He wrote a piece called How Do Christians Fit Into the Two-Party System? They Don't in the New York Times. I'd recommend it to everybody, as well as all his work. He was really a, a man of great vision. Well, thanks so much. Appreciate that. Thanks again for being with us today. Hope you enjoyed our conversation. Just remember, if it's about God and government, it's faith and politics. See you next time.